but a whole essay on that. <laughs> they, I mean, they did fairly well. That's one of the things. The, the, AP, the AP exams graded on the curve. Oh, they do. Yeah, they grade on the curve. Oh. That's either good or bad. Oh, okay. Yeah, it could be bad too. You know, if everybody in the world does great, then they still only let half pass. Yeah, it's not the AP exam is not like you know 90, 80, 70, 60. It's literally they give you a score and then they cut it right in half. That half passes, that half fails. And it's a five-point scale, so that the half that passes will be a three, four, then a few on top or five. So here, can't happen that way. So if everybody gets a really good score, they, they, the greatest the greatest system is so complex the way the mathematical formula. There'll be a lot of different scores. They literally just find the median score. And it's it's, it's, it's tough. Or if everyone does bad, yeah. so it's not a proficiency, a proficiency test. You know, it's not like a test to see how smart you are. Really. Be than everyone else. Yeah, that's the hard part. Now, and we have good schools here, and so we normally do significantly better than, than 50%. But still, that's what I hate is, so all you guys will get is a score. You remember that from AP Euro? You get like a, a you get a four, a three or four, something like that. Three, you pass, great. Almost all colleges, you get college credit. You know, University of Montana, you get six credits. That's awesome. But you don't have any idea what you do. I just figured yeah. out this it's magic! <laughs> no, all I was gonna say is I just have no idea what you did good on. Yeah, I have no idea what you missed. I got a vague idea that gives a little bit. Because I'll get something like a percentage didn't do well on the DBQ. But I have no idea if that means what did you do well? You didn't know anything, or you just the way you formatted it was bad. Um, you know, it's really it's a little frustrating to teach. So I just can't. We just can't. Work. All right, let's get to work tomorrow. If you want to come in at lunch tomorrow for class and ask questions from the review list, I'll be glad to answer anything. And if we do that tomorrow and you come in, I will give you hints about what things will be on the test and what things will not be on the test. Sound good? So you're like, yeah. So, so if you come in, you I'll be glad to ask questions. I'll come in. I'll do. Next, uh, ba, 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 ba. here's a pack of the notes. This is populism. So the last thing we talk about is on there, and also we'll do the progressive sort of stuff in the next semester too. And imperialism, talk about the Spanish American War. Thank you. Funny action. I was pretty extra. So Saving for next year. I'm trying to remember, I thought there was something else. Oh, so our test is going to be then right after lunch on Wednesday. And basically, there'll be a couple things on the review list that I might not get to in class, and I'll tell you that specifically, which ones you might have to look in the your note packet. But for the most part, where I quit tomorrow is the last thing that could be on the test. Sound good? And you have 20 short IDs and one more little thing. Oh, what's tomorrow, by the way? I'll give you a little strip of paper. In fact, here it is. Let me see here. So we have to write the name and the initials. And then the initial for the party. Okay. So, N F R D W R. Those are the parties. G N T W. No party, Federalist Party, Republican, Democrat, Whig. That's it. Those are the parties. And if you miss, if you miss one party, the parties will not be waiting here as much as the name. So don't freak out if you're against someone's party. That's not as big a deal as the name. Basically, what I do is I will take only half off because of the party, and I'll round down. So if you only miss one party, I won't take any off. But, and if you miss get one up one president out of order, I'm not gonna mark every one wrong. All right, so we got right to did we get to the panic? <laughs> did we mention the panic Yeah, yeah. Okay. We had over speculation of the bubble. So when the panic hit, once the bubble popped, this led to all of a sudden, literally overnight, 
People lost money they thought they had. You know, if you think you have a piece of paper, a stock that's worth $100, then you act like you have $100. You go to a bank and use that as collateral. You can even sell it. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. Then all of a sudden it goes down to $20. You've lost $80. It's called in paper value. You thought you had this much, now you have this much. And so literally overnight, people had less money than they quit spending. Banks that survived quit loaning. I mentioned bank panic, didn't I? Did we talk about bank panic? I don't think so. Well, this is the, the bubble pop that's going to trigger a bank panic. And a bank panic is this. Just imagine you have a bank. There's a bank. And they made all these loans for speculation. They make all these loans. Well, all of a sudden, people can't pay back the money they thought because of this, because of the bubble burst. And so the bank all of a sudden, we're not getting our money. And what happens? People who have savings in their thought, uh-oh, the bank might go under. What should I do today? Take all my money. If one person does it, the bank can afford it. What if everybody comes at once? That's the panic. And what happens is everybody comes at once, the bank collapses. And you think, okay, weak bank collapses, you know, that's what happens. Now, we also, what happens to your savings if you the bank collapses? Before 1933, poof, like it never existed. Well, even healthy banks just will happen to. Because let's say you're looking at all your neighbors and they're running their bank, and the bank shut the door, you're thinking, well, my bank, I better go get, get, take my money out of that bank. So the bank penny can spread to healthy banks because no bank has all that money on hand. They're operating under the assumption that only a few people will come at once to take their deposits out. If they all come at once, they collapse. In 1933, part of the first New Deal, uh, Democrats in Congress would pass a bill that would regulate banks, and they put insurance on accounts. And so even if the bank collapses, you still get at least most of your savings back. Called the FDIC, I've seen it here, look at a bank. And that saved the world's economy in 2008. Saved the world. I'm actually not exaggerating. There could have been a huge bank panic, but that didn't happen because of FDIC. So it's only. <laughs> Why are all of you lurking in my hallway? Why are you picked out? Oh, you're taking your final. Oh, you're taking your final. So, back to this. Now I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, yeah. So, it happened in 2008, but it, they didn't have that in 1873. And so, what do you think banks that survived, what are they going to do? Close. Some actually did it. Or they would lock their doors for a while. They called it a bank holiday. Sometimes the bankers would just kind of go in the middle of the night, grab the money, put it in the pocket, take off. And banks that survived with loaning money. When times are good, they're loaning to everybody. We're all going to get rich. Bad times. <laughs> I don't trust anybody. So even, or so what happens is, no one can get money when they need it. Money just freezes. And that makes the crash worse. Within six months, a third of all industrial workers in the Northeast lost their jobs. A third. In, a month, in, in six months. In six months. We don't have exact figures, you know, because of the influx of immigration, and, and they just didn't keep exact numbers then. Similar thing happened during the Great Depression. And so then there's even more people not spending money, and the depression spread. The economy shrunk, businesses shut their doors. This was a catastrophe. And what we call a depression is going to come out of this. I'm going to give you a couple words real fast. Depression doesn't have a mathematical, like, unemployment goes out by this much is a depression. Depression is just long term unemployment, long term financial problems. So the Great Depression went from 1929, for example, to 1939. 
long term. This one, 1873, till in the early 1880s is when it finally ended. So it could be a long term. The economy might start growing again, but there's still just a lot of unemployment. It's kind of slow, declining economy. But I'm going to give you one more economic term. Recession is actually an economic term. They mathematically figure this out. And it's three quarters of declining economic growth. The economy shrinks for three straight quarters. What's a quarter? Three months. So nine months total, if the economy declines, that's a recession. So a recession might help trigger a depression. And so for example, the recession that actually began the economic slide actually started in 1872. But the actual the financial panic, the crash, hit in 1873. The Great Depression, the recession began about eight months before the stock market crashed. It kind of triggered it when people, oh my goodness, it's here. In 2008, the recession began in winter of 2007. But then the panic hit in October 2008. So, that's what happened. Yeah. What starts a recession? Well, a recession is a declining economy. So it's the beginning of what we call a bust. And I will show you exactly what it is in a few minutes. Okay? I will, I'll tell you how the boom bust happens. So i got to explain that to you. And so, what we have is this. And it goes on year after year. More unemployment, wages drop, profits drop. A few companies survive. By the way, if you survive a bust, this panic, your company, you made it. You don't go under, you got money left over. What kind of shape are you in? What is happening to all your competitors? So what can you do? Or maybe, well, you can't do it quite yet because no one has money. But you can scoop up your competitors, you can take advantage of markets as they go under. The big do well if they survive. They don't survive, obviously. I think we can figure that one out. Well, in eight, by 1876, by 1876, there's nationwide disruption. In fact, do you remember the election of 1876 that had the compromise of 1877? Do you remember that? When the Republican Hayes didn't win the popular vote during Reconstruction, but he, but they basically gave him three states Florida, South Carolina, and Louisiana. So he won the Electoral College. That was a compromise. But Hayes agreed to end what? You remember that? What did Hayes agree to end? You're on the right track. What was going on from 1865 to 1877? Construction. Now, this is something hopefully you remember once I said it. And you probably think I'll miss it, but it's really the overall reconstruction. Hayes agreed to end reconstruction to get elected. But part of the reason they were willing to get, get rid of reconstruction because this panic was so bad. There was so much unemployment. It was like, we got our own problems. Yes? Wait, so, um, <laughs> Yeah, Hayes was a Northern Republican. He won. Why did it help for Reconstruction? Remember, Reconstruction was when the North had troops there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember Reconstruction, the Military Reconstruction Act. Yeah. History. Exactly. And they were kind of, you know, so they want to they want to be left alone. Right. And then you know, so they get sharecropping and take back control of their economy. Okay, so in 1877, all hell broke. 1877 is going to be the year of the Great Upheaval. The Great Upheaval is a nice way of saying revolution. Revolution. It was only in the north, the northeast. And it started along the B&O Railroad. The B&O Railroad was one of the most prosperous railroads of the northeast. It basically covered the eastern coast. And then they went to Chicago and St. Louis. So it's a pretty big railroad here. Very profitable back then. Yeah. So is this under depression? Yes. It, this is under.
under what's all under the panic of 1873. So this is this the strike is because of the depression caused by the panic of 1873. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so what have the B&O Railroad been doing since 1875? Now, they actually were still making money, not as much as 1872, but they were still profiting. But what were they doing to wages? What's that? Why were they dropping wages? They were successful and they could drop. But why could they? Because the competitors had to drop their wages too. Competitors might have to, but think about it for a second. If they dropped their wages, their workers had to take it. Why? Because there's nowhere else. It's hard to get a job. It's hard to get jobs. Because what is their all? If all they can tell the workers is say, you can't cut my wages. And they'll tell the workers, look outside. All those people are unemployed. You're going to give up your job? I can just pick out people and they'll work for less than what I'm paying. That's why they cut wages. They cut wages because the labor market had an oversupply of workers. Oversupply of workers, wages could be cut. So they're still making money, but they cut wages. Yeah. Baltimore and Ohio. Yeah. So it's a Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, B and O. Everyone called it the B and O. Yes, when Monopoly was invented, that's one of the Eastern Railroads, so that's why it's on there. What is it? The B and O, the Reading. The short line in the Pennsylvania. Does that sound right? For Monopoly? So is this wage? Is that this is not the short line? Isn't it the reading? Pennsylvania? I thought it's a short line. What's that though? So why did you put that under this? The Beano Railroad cut their workers' wages by nearly 30% in 1877. And they had already cut the wages two other times the year before. So in 1877, they now, here's another 30% cut, essentially. And the workers, you can imagine how just terrifying this would be. They see unemployed people all over. Unemployed, how do you feed your family? Where do you go for work? No one's hiring. And so what happened was, they went on strike. Now, there were a few labor unions trying to organize railway workers, but don't think of it in terms as some, any kind of you know, workers in a union got together and said, we are going to be both to strike. No, it wasn't like that at all. It was just this massive, just the only way to describe it was just massive kind of groundswell of anger. Panic. How dare you do this? We have had enough. We are treated unfairly. It's got to stop. Yeah. Um, like everywhere. Just to be an old railroad. I mean, every company was cutting wages. But we're talking specifically about the B&O first. And they went on strike. And the strike is just this outpouring of anger and rage and fear. People were worried about their future. It started in Wheeling, West Virginia. But one we need to know is it began to spread up and down the B&O. In Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, railway workers there went struck. They have a huge terminal there with repair facilities and all these things. And they not only went on strike, they blocked the tracks and said, you can't use this railroad again until you, well, basically, don't cut or pay anymore. Well, the governor of Pennsylvania, in beautiful, so we're talking now Pennsylvania, they sent out the militia. That's what they always did, the militia to force the workers to go back to work. Who makes up the militia? What kind of people? The workers. And what happened? The workers or the militia join the strikers. What's what's the rebellion that led to the to the Constitution in Massachusetts? No, Bacon's a hundred years earlier. Shay's rebellion. It's very good. I know it's kind of you get all these rebellions and words mixed up, but you remembered it. Shay's rebellion was exactly the same thing in 1787. Exactly the same thing in that the militia joined the Shays Rebellion at first because those guys were fighting against you know the farmers being treated unfairly. Well, this set panic, first off, those who had the railroads totally panicked. But the rail the strike spread up and down those tracks and soon spread to other railroads and then to other businesses. And the B and O railroad strike 
turn into a nationwide strike. And that's why they call it the great upheaval. Workers all over and unemployed people marched, took to the street, demanded to be treated fairly. As they saw, the system is unfair. It's unfair to us. We want to work, but we can't because the economy has crashed and we're starving. So, what do you do? In St. Louis, workers actually took over the city. They, they actually stormed the city hall and took it over and created their own short-term city government. They even came up with a flag. And the flag was a big, what's called a revolution? Red. Yeah, red. From the French Revolution, that's why the Soviet flag was red. Red is the color of patriots' blood. That's literally what it means. That became in the revolutions of 1830 in Paris. France, they're all in revolt. But they embroidered a loaf of bread with a sword to it on a red field. What does that tell you about the workers when it came right down to it? Why were they striking? They're hungry and they hate bread. Kill the bread. No, they're hungry. So the whole thing was about food. So a couple of things we can get from this. Remember I talked about you know, socialism yesterday? Remember that? Social Darwinism and all the different ideologies? This is an ideology. They just want a better life. So it's something very simple. They're not revolutionaries in the context of, we demand communism because we know it's right or whatever. They just want a fair shake. It's they see. And secondly, if you want to become a totalitarian dictator, which I know some of you are thinking, right, Liberty? In fact, Liberty is a perfect name for totalitarianism. <laughs> See, because you can say, how could you go against me? My name's Stan from Liberty. Right? You already thought about this? What's the first thing you do? If you want to be a totalitarian dictator, what do you do? You got to change your name to Liberty, then what? Feed people. You give them food, and they won't revolt. Then you give them something to watch, something with a screen. Now before, you know, 20 years ago, just give them a TV. Now, just we have all kinds of new things with screens, right? So they become addicted to that, they watch TV, and they won't complain about anything. In fact, all you gotta do is they start complaining is shut off their screen. And they function, they don't function, they will, they go in the corner in a fetal position and cry, correct? And then you turn it back on, give them a loaf of bread, and boom. See, as you reach for your phone, you're a classic example of totalitarian Totalitarianism? How do you get to that? Is that a moment there, too? True. You have a phone? Water, good. You don't have a phone? You've left it here. You've given it to me many times, but I keep giving it back. Do you have a phone? Do you have a phone? Does he? No? It's up. It's so weird now. We're all well, not we. You are all addicted to that. Sorry, I'm not. I'm, I'm from a different generation, so I'm still older. So, yes, I do have a phone, but I'm not quite as addicted as you. You don't want to In in uh, I gotta put the pictures up. But in in AP Euro, they dress up as French Revolution. That's what that was my dress up day, and. One of my students dress up as a, a, a sans collage about two loaves of French bread. As for revolution, so see, perfect. She understands. You got this, you wrote this down then? Yeah. Now, when you take over, remember who taught you this. Yeah. I'm the kind of person that you get rid of. So, this spread nationwide. President Hayes did not, at first, he was very reluctant to do anything. But all of the business leaders were coming to him. In fact, the famous robber baron, Jay Gould, who tried to corner the gold market, tried to corner the uh, Union Pacific Railroad, a pretty duplicitous man. His solution to President Hayes was, let's hire half the poor people to kill the other half. <laughs> and he was very serious. Now, when I mean talk about poor people, to him, poor people were virtually everybody else except that tiny little group on top. So that was his plan. But what happened was, Hayes would be convinced to use the Commerce Clause. Remember the Constitution, how it says that 
This is one of the compromises that the federal government can regulate interstate commerce. And since this strike cut off the railroads between the states, Hayes could say it's violating the Commerce Code clause and the strike. So the strike really wasn't organized and it did not end. That allowed him to send troops. Before we get to the troops, remember, Reconstruction just ended. So we had troops fresh from Reconstruction duty that were sent all along. The biggest areas were here where the railroad, the major railroads were. Yeah. Yeah, because it, they, they, what Hayes said was, or it's Justice Department, Justice Department, that the strike was violating the interstate commerce because it crossed state lines. What is what's, what's the interstate? Hmm? What is that? What does that mean? What did it violate? The Commerce Clause. And the Commerce Clause is part of the Constitution. Remember how it said that Congress. But the Constitution says the federal government can regulate interstate commerce. That's the Congress clause. So how did this? The strikes cross state lines. Oh. So interstate commerce. Okay. It's a pretty broad reading of this. That's what we call a very loose interpretation of the Constitution. They sent troops, fresh from Reconstruction. And it was partially accidental, but it would become the norm for the next 50 years. The kind of troops they would send to put down strikes would be troops like this who are mostly black troops. Black troops from Reconstruction duty were sent to put down white workers in the north. They wouldn't unify because of what? Racism kept them apart. And that became the tool. Black troops would be recruited for one purpose for the next 50 years, put down strikes. Happened, happened to be one time happened in Anaconda. A really big one in Coeur d'Alene. Really a big one there. And so, we don't know how many people died in this fight to put it down. It's in the hundreds. Probably not over, probably uh, a few hundred, many more people would be wounded. But this was a bloody, violent takeover. A couple things we got to get out of this. First off, oh no, we can't have this again. Malicious? In the Constitution, it says a couple things. That malicious will be funded and by the federal government, and then the Second Amendment says states can have a militia. Remember, it's without slavery governments. But they have malicious, but they weren't very organized, as shown by this when they joined. So the year after it, Congress passed a law to organize militias, to give it an organization training certain rules that every state must follow. Now, the governor of the states can still have, essentially, control of the militia within the states, but it's set up an organized, the term 100 years earlier would have been regulated militia. What did they create? The National Guard. Exactly. The National Guard came out of the great upheaval. The National Guard was created by law with certain rules. The federal government will give them the weapons, also provide the training, but the big reason for the National Guard, to put down internal rebellion. That was the big reason for the National Guard. Yeah, obviously we need a reserve force to mobilize the term is in case there's war, but National Guard. And that's where this comes from. If you look at the National Guard and, yeah, it is the original idea of it, the original National Guard in 1878, in case another great upheaval happens. We need some. Which kind of fits in, remember the original reason for militias, why Southerners were so nuts and wouldn't ratify the Constitution, why we need something to put down slave rebellions. So there's always a backstory. But there's something else. This rebellion showed a couple things. If workers unify, they really do have power. This will be an impetus for labor unions. An argument, hey, if we work together, especially in bad times, we have power. Also, it showed what? What would the capitalists be willing to do to maintain their control? Increase wages. Huh? Will they? What's that? Yeah, they'll, they'll use force to keep what they have. Oh, yeah, they might in the long run figure out it might be better to keep wages high than use soldiers. But they'll do whatever it takes. There is going to be, that's what we have to get. From 1877 to the end of the century, 24,000 
strikes in the United States, major strikes. From the United States is going to have unprecedented labor strikes where workers are going to demand higher wages and better benefits, and companies are going to do whatever they can to stop them. Yeah, what? From this 1877 to the end of the century, so 1900. Yeah, 24,000. Which is weird. There's now no one strikes because, well, there's a pretty high number of people are not working and people are really scared. You just don't have it anymore. Back then, people, workers were like, I'm going to take matters in my own hands. It's a lot different today. People aren't scared. They really are. I mean, there's, it's, it's a scared country. New world. What's worth it? What causes this? Amen caused it. Why did you do this? Why not? Things are going too good. Why are there booms? Why are there busts? Why does this happen? Believers in laws are fair. Say, it's natural. The sun comes up. The tide rolls in. There's an economic boom. There's an economic bust. Let it ride. But it's not like that. There would be an economist at this time that would figure out what's called the business cycle. The business cycle. It's also called the boom bust cycle. And the business cycle is endemic in capitalism. There'll be booms and then there'll be busts. And it's endemic with this idea of trying to get bigger, to get market share in competition. Also, the finance and develop out is endemic. Now, the person who came up with this idea. He said, this business cycle proves that capitalism is flawed and it's got to go away. It's got to be replaced with something else. Does anybody want to guess the economist? I told you him before. Marx. Exactly. Karl Marx was the one who first really came up with how business cycles happen. But he did it with the concept of, see, told you capitalism doesn't work. But every bus has these basic fundamentals. So let me show you how it happens. So we're going to draw a graph, and it's going to be a big circle. And it, it's going to, you got to put some words in here. And on top will be boom, on the bottom will be bust. So here will be boom, bust. Yeah. So it'll be a circle. And there'll be a few things I'll draw in there. So that probably won't be enough. For me. You know, I mean, I'm going to put words in me. You can, Cram them in however you want to, but that should be fine. So it would be a circle. So it kind of goes top, and then it goes kind of evolves down to bust, and then back up. And this is how it happens. First off, let's get a couple things about a boom. What do we know about a boom? And we'll ask the same about the same things when we get to a bust. So if the economy's booming, now think about an economy boom. All kinds of new businesses are starting. Stores are full. People are buying and selling stuff. Everybody's like, wow, you know, uh, expanding. Things are going good. So, what's happening to prices of goods? They're going up. Prices are going up because people want stuff. What's happening to profits? Now, not for everybody. Of course, it's more complex than that. But okay, profits going up. How about? Unemployment. Unemployment's going down. So there are fewer and fewer workers looking for jobs. So what's happening to wages? Fewer people looking for jobs. So companies have to compete for the few workers. Or if you have a job, you can leverage it for higher wages. Because you can always say, hey, down the street, they're going to hire me. Other stuff. What's happening to the value of stocks and bonds and that kind of thing? Up. Oh, yeah, we're all making money. Tomorrow we're going to make more money. What's happening to banks? I'm going to put down credit. What are banks doing at this time? Yeah, like mad. They're competing with each other to loan money because everybody's making money. So credit is going up. You just think about banks loaning money. And we can keep going. But last one, how's confidence? 
confidence is skyrocketing. Skyrocketing. And the big thing about confidence, confidence is this. When a boom is going on, everybody thinks tomorrow will be what? Better. If tomorrow's going to be better, why not spend today? So people will spend, they'll buy stuff for themselves or invest in companies or expand their companies or buy stock or speculate or buy real estate, all these things because tomorrow it's going to be better. In fact, you're a sucker for not buying it today because the price is going to go up tomorrow, aren't they? So spend, 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 spend. Buy. And there's another thing that happens in every single bust in the history of mankind. People think it'll go on forever. Every single time people think this is different. Prices will go up forever. So it happened in the real estate market that caused the crash that you lived through. It happened here with railroads. It's, we're going to get rich. Bye, bye, bye. Let's go get rich together. Well, what happens? Every time. And this is actually kind of funny in a sad way. Every time this happens, it's really weird. In the late 1990s, it was technology stocks will never drop in value. Crash. Real estate will never drop in value. Crash. What's, what would be next? Anybody want to take a guess? Actually, if you could guess which one will crash, you can get really rich. What's the movie about that? The real estate crashing? The Big Short. It just got nominated for Academy Award. Anyone seen it? I have not seen it. I've heard it's very good. It, has anyone heard of it or just looked at me like I heard it's just fantastic and really funny too. One of the few movies that you they could take something as complicated as credit default swaps and make it funny. None of you know what a credit default swap is, do you? You're lucky. So, what comes? What begins the downward slide? Happens every time. Overproduction, over speculation. Actually, the word we should use is oversupply. There's an oversupply of goods, and everybody is speculating, thinking there's going to be, we're going to get rich. Every single time. So almost always we're going to get some kind of bubble. Prices are expanding. We talked about this yesterday, right? So a bubble's happening. What happens? Before the bubble burst, and you're right, it will burst, and they always burst. What happens to prices, or for that matter, stock values? Prices begin to do what if you produce more than what people want to buy? Prices begin to go down. If you produce, if there's more goods than what people buy, they have to cut prices to get people to buy it. Okay, so prices begin to drop. Now you think about it. If there's oversupply because people are producing too many goods, providing too many services, logically, what should they do to stop this? It's actually a death spiral. What should they do? Stop production. Stop production. But think about it as an individual company. If I stop production, all of a sudden now I don't get as much revenue. If I don't get as much revenue, I can't pay back that loan I took to expand my business. So I can't cut back. So overall, it makes sense, but it's individual. Uh -uh. In fact, what do they do? Every single time. What's that? They produce more. Every single time. Revenues are dropping because I'm not selling as much. I got to sell more. But everybody thinks that. So what happens? Prices drop even more. Same thing happens in the stock market. There'll be like a, and this happened in your lifetime. It happened in 2007, 2008. There'll be a few big crashes in the stock market. And people are like, ooh, wait a second. Stocks are overvalued. What should we do? Ooh, they dropped in price. Let's buy more. Every single time. And eventually, that's when the bubble bursts. And people realize, oh. Boom, it explodes. And that's when we get to cutbacks. People sell their stock, people close their factories. And if you get cutbacks, what happens? You gotta have layoffs. People start cutting back on workers, or they don't pay back their debts. All these things start happening, and here's the biggie. What happens to demand for goods? If people, have, if people are unemployed, Demand drops. 
And when demand drops, more cutbacks. And that is the death spiral of this. Once that begins to happen, you can see the beginning here and then a death spiral here. By the way, if you ever go by a little store, someone starts a little store, and maybe they're doing go to a restaurant or a market or something like that, you can always tell, and it's the same thought when they start there, and it's really sad. I mean, you know, see this, oh no, they're not making it. You ever see a store, and all of a sudden they'll have like 25% uh, off everything? Or it'd be like a restaurant, and they'll say, all oh, you can eat for $5. You just try to get people to come in. Why do they do that? The same logic as this. Because you know you're about to ask. It's a desperate move knowing that they won't make much money of it, but they got to make some money. That is the same thing. And that's how I see that, and it's really sad. Because you know, most people probably, you know, they invest it a lot. It's, you know, they're in trouble. And so, but there are a couple of stores I, I drive by on my way to work, and I, I've seen this, but I don't know. It's hard to start a business, obviously. And the best thing that really hits here, the worst thing, I'm sorry, is best. This is awesome. What do banks begin to do? The banks that survive the panic. So that always happens. What? They stop loaning money. It's called a credit freeze. They just quit. In fact, we kind of had this in 2000. We we're like here in 2008. And then in October, the crash and the freeze happened in October 2008. And it was literally like the economy's going along, and all of a sudden, bang, hit the wall. And it was like, stopped. And that's the, that's the depression. That in reality, we're just still kind of edging out of it. Much of the rest of the world's still in. That's when we get a bust. So let's look at those things I talked about a bust. What's happening to prices during a bust? They're going down fast because companies can't sell their stuff. Now you think that's great if you're a consumer, but what's happening to profits? Profits are going down. What's the next thing? What's happening to unemployment? It's going up. Going up. What's happening to wages? It's going down. Wages going down. What's happening to stocks? It's going down. Going down because people are worried that tomorrow might be worse. What's happening to what's the next thing I said? Huh? Is it credit first? Yeah. What's credit? What's happening to banks? Going down. And then confidence. What's happening to confidence? And this is one of the big ones. In a boom, we're going to get rich forever. In a bust, we're all going to die. The world is falling apart. Gee, I wonder what happens to attendance in churches in bad economic times. Anybody want to guess? Dramatically. Actually, it's got half church attendance goes down and boom. It's really. People are fine, but it does. It really does happen. Well, we get to this real quick. For the I know we almost bell ring, but the thing is this: it's a spiral we can't get out of. If a bunch of people are unemployed, imagine you two lose your job, you're laid off. What are you four going to do? Even though you've got your job, what are you going to do with your money? Are you going to spend it? I might lose my job tomorrow. And so that makes even less demand. So it spirals down. Something has to change to get it out. Oh, there's a name for this. This is called the deflationary curve. Deflationary curve. I know I wrote that fast. Prices are dropping. Deflationary curve. So something has got to trigger demand. Something has got to trigger. Businesses won't start selling stuff because nobody will buy their stuff. People won't buy anything either because they don't have money or they figure I don't want to spend today because I don't know what tomorrow is going to be. Every time this has happened, what has increased demand? What is the one thing that can do it if business won't spend money? Because why hire workers? No one's going to buy the stuff. People won't spend money because they don't know about tomorrow. Who can? The government. Yeah, it's always the government. The government in some ways begins to stimulate demand. How will they do it? Panic of 1873, they spent more money on transcontinental railroads. They started building railroads. Great Depression, providing jobs in the World War II something. President Obama in 2009 got through Congress a very small bill to try to stimulate the economy. Worked for a little bit, stopped the free fall, but it wasn't enough to really get the boom again, but at least we quit the decline. Finish it small. 
Okay, just a little bit. I have good news for all of you. See this graph we're doing right here? Wouldn't this be awesome to also do this on your semester test? No. You, it's going to be, so you want to let's try it again. Wouldn't this be awesome to put in your semester test? Yeah, so just put boom by cycle. If you could do this basically, I'll do your part. Sound good? I have a little bit left to finish tomorrow. By the way, does anybody want to guess what curve this is going to be? Inflation. Inflationary, good. Tomorrow, then a few things, and then I'll go. We're just going to kind of go, oh, after the president's place. How do we deal with the answer? Oh, I got, I'll give it back tomorrow to where I can quit. Okay. Essay's very good in here. Very good, almost all A's and B's. A few people kind of did some yeah, CIT stuff, but most are really good. I was pleased, so we, we're going to do, we're going to do an essay on the semester final. Too. <laughs> no, there's some good parts. No, most of them are pretty good. Yeah, there's always some hard spots. Hard to use, people forget the hard People just start explaining what you're going to show you how it's done. It's really easy to do. They also have a corporation. We all do. Everyone I know did that in that sense. Did a lot today. I'm getting too old for this. I gotta be. Maybe I should go to be one of those guys who just hand out worksheets. Can I do that? Well, there's a movie, it wasn't a great movie, it's called Teachers. I don't know if you ever seen it in the 80s. It's actually not a great movie, but they had a teacher in there, and it's one of those, he had every student face away from him. Or face, you know, he had a desk in front, and all the desks were facing that way, so he could see if it was going around. And what they would do, they walk into class, and he had stacks of worksheets. Oh, they would come in, they just grab their stacks, sit down, and <laughs> Every day, so you sit and read the paper. The whole joke was in the movie, and it's a funny joke, he had a heart attack and died. <laughs> but since nobody said anything, they just had the worksheets and work, nobody realized it the next day. Would that be awesome? That'd be kind of fun. Who's going today? You're going, let's go. Yes. Did you actually get a link from me? Uh, you know, I didn't check. Uh, yeah.